This video is sponsored by Paradox Interactive. Hey everybody, it's Party Elite, and today we're taking a look at Age of Wonders 4, the brand new 4X game that takes the Age of Wonders series back to its fantasy roots. I've released a few beginner's guide videos on the channel already, and you can find them in the playlist linked under the I at the top right corner of the screen and at the end of the video. If you're looking for more information about the game or you want to grab it for yourself, check out the link in the pinned comment and description down below, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask away in the comments. I'll have a playthrough kicking off on the channel very soon if it hasn't started already, and for that you might want to subscribe, but otherwise, with no more time to waste, and with timestamps down below, let's begin. Don't ignore realm details. The level of customization in Age of Wonders 4 is immense. Apart from customizing your faction and determining how you develop through the selection of tomes and upgrades, there are a multitude of ways in which the world itself can be tweaked and adjusted. Pay attention to these variables as they can make a very big difference to how you should approach things. When selecting one of the pre-made realms, take a moment to check the tooltips and understand exactly what you're getting yourself into. Pre-made realms aside, when you're building your own realm, think about the options you have on hand and the kind of experience you're looking for. You can choose to make the game harder for yourself, of course, heck, half the time that's half the fun, but make sure you actually keep in mind the decisions you made so you can strategize around them or with them. Some realms will require you to invest in the ability to traverse over water, while others will not. A faction with Arctic Adaptation is basically wasting a trait in a scorched climate, but one with Desert Adaptation will thrive in a desert realm. But it goes beyond climate and landmass distribution. A realm with rampant flora will give empires with fire damage output a slight advantage, especially early on, whereas a demonic realm would create the opposite situation, both due to the kind of inhabitants you'll typically find on the realm. And heck, the Pretender King's modifier completely changes the wind conditions. Then there's a potential of up to four miscellaneous traits that can completely change how things play as well. If the realm is a domain of mayhem, you can expect to lose control of your units every three turns in battle, having them go berserk and potentially attacking friendly units instead of the enemy if you don't plan ahead. A realm with crystalline abundance will allow you to be a bit more invested in the use of magic, and a realm with warping wilds is one where leaving provinces with undesirable natural features unclaimed is a better idea than not, since they'll magically and randomly switch around until claimed. This also means realms with warping wilds are ones where claiming the right territory quickly is that much more important. Realms with city-states will require more of an investment if you want to rely on free cities, and a realm with banner lords will make vassalizing free cities that much more worthwhile. Megacities will ensure everybody is forced to operate from one central city, and regenerating infestations will force you to be constantly on the lookout for new infestations in unoccupied provinces, taking more of your attention than usual and asking you to reconsider how you expand. From the kinds of damage output that units are more or less resistant to, to the kinds of provinces and the likelihood of units suffering from the inability to regenerate more often than not, there are many things to take into consideration when building your faction and when actually diving into a new game in the realm too. Don't forget the realm's unique elements, and try to use them to your advantage. Or, at the very least, try not to set yourself up for failure. Expanding poorly. This is a bigger problem than might first meet the eye, especially when dealing with tougher AI difficulties or playing against other people. Knowing when and where to expand, and when and where not to expand, is extremely important right from the beginning. For one, building province improvements in the wrong order can hamper the rate at which your empire makes progress. You can watch the video linked in the pinned comment below for a deeper dive into that, and more, but as a brief overview for context, some city structures can only be built if prerequisite province improvements have been built first, and if you have certain empire upgrades, adjacencies can generate additional benefits, and some special province improvements rely on adjacencies for maximized benefits. The Forest of Stakes, for example, increases draft output per adjacent forester. Picking placement for basic and special province improvements is very important, but fortunately, if you ever need to make an adjustment, you can. It just takes some time to swap from one province improvement to another, and though that might slow you down in some ways, if done right, it can start to pay dividends immediately. Apart from that, Adding new cities to your empire is essential if you want to get the most out of the realm. While this is obviously not an option in a realm with the megacities trait, and while taking the single city challenge on is absolutely viable, a single city will eventually and 
more quickly reach its limit and it'll create a suboptimal situation. This is because cities are able to build upgrades and structures within the city itself, adding to the overall productivity of your empire beyond province improvements. Apart from that, you actually need additional cities as a way to secure additional heroes. Heroes are really powerful on the battlefield. They can equip all sorts of armor and weapons, and as they level up, they gain access to skills that can bolster themselves and the troops in their army. You can get pretty far with just one hero in your entire empire, your leader, but if you'd like to secure some variety and feel like you need the extra tool in your arsenal, establishing an additional city early on is something you might want to consider. As you're doing that though, keep in mind that you do have a limited number of cities that you can optimally manage at a time. I don't just mean as a player, I mean as a game mechanic. Going over your city limit will very quickly start to destroy your economy, with a 25% reduction in output for all of your cities for each city you're over your limit by. This is absolutely huge and it can completely cripple your economy and wreck your empire if you don't do something about it. On the one hand, you can just avoid going over the limit in the first place, claiming provinces with outposts and waiting until your city limit gives you some wiggle room before you upgrade said outpost into a city. On the other hand, you can release a city as a vassal. You'll lose some control over what they do and when, but they'll pay you a fraction of their income and sometimes that's better than the hit to your economy from going over your limit. Those aside, you can also simply increase your city limit, though it can cost quite a bit of Imperium to do so, and it might take some time to accumulate enough to pull the trigger on that decision. Your affinity determines how your empire makes progress down these branches, but the sum of your affinities will send your empire further and further down this bottom path here. About halfway through it, you'll get access to this repeatable option that will increase your city limit by one each time you use it. Don't spend the Imperium if you aren't currently in need of the increased city limit, since this option does literally nothing else, but if you're about to expand beyond your limitations, it's a good idea to bank the Imperium first so that you can pull the trigger on this option and save yourself from the economic penalties. Improper War Declarations While playing as a pacifist and only ever getting involved in defensive wars is an option, chances are you'll want to be a warmonger every once in a while, or at least dabble in aggressive expansion from time to time when a particularly juicy province gets stolen out from under you, or when you're chasing after specific types of victories. But going to war in Age of Wonders 4 has nuance. There's war with free cities, and then there's war with other empires. A war that you declare against free cities will cause your alignment to shift towards evil. That's not always a problem, though if your faction has a high culture, they might see the impact of shifting alignment, and apart from that, your relations with other empires and free cities will be impacted by your alignment too, so a shift here is something to think about. The impacts of declaring war get much more consequential when involving other empires. First, it's important to understand that relations between two empires are tracked separately from grievances between them. You can get along with another empire but still be upset at them for certain things that they did. That's just politics. Relations are impacted by affinities and past actions, as well as the AI leader's personality and how it matches your behaviors. Relations are also impacted by treaties like the wizard's bond, by gifts, and by pronouncements. These pronouncements also tie into the bigger topic of conversation here, grievances. What you need to know here is that an ongoing declaration of friendship is a great way to reduce the impact of grievances, while an ongoing declaration of rivalry is a great way to increase the impact of grievances. Depending on circumstances, you'll want one or the other, though bear in mind they have other consequences too and upkeep costs as well. Grievances themselves are key to declaring wars, and the sum total of grievances between two parties determines how justified an aggressor would be in declaring a war. Grievances can be fabricated at the cost of gold, mana, and relations, or they can be the result of insults or through territorial encroachment. Empires have claims to provinces that are adjacent to them, and distant claims to provinces up to three steps away, and if a foreign empire builds an outpost in these claimed provinces, a grievance is born. Now, most grievances can be atoned for with money, if the aggressor is willing to pay, and the victim can choose to forgive them, shifting the numbers back and forth. You can declare a war at any time, but if this number is too low or in the negatives, it means your war is unjustified to a degree, and the level of unjustness will determine the penalties that you take on as a result of the declaration. 
these can be extremely punishing on the extreme end if you rely on not being evil aligned, or on relations with other empires, or on Imperium. On the flip side, if the war is completely justified, you'll actually get quite a few buffs and benefits. Try to swing war justification in your favor whenever you can, before declaring a war at least. Pay off old grievances to bring the total sum closer to something that doesn't hurt you first, and then move in to declare your war. Alternatively, try to aggravate the enemy as much as you can to get them to declare the war instead, and then punish them for their hubris. Whichever way you approach matters, don't forget to use grievances wisely to either declare a war without suffering penalties, or to ensure the enemy can't freely declare one on you without suffering penalties themselves. I hope this video has given you some insight on Age of Wonders 4, and if you're curious about more tips and guides on how to play, don't hesitate to check out the playlist I've linked in the pinned comment down below and on screen right now. Feel free to ask questions below or subscribe to the channel for more strategy gaming content, and as always, a massive thanks goes out to all of the channel members and patrons who've been supporting the channel on a monthly basis. Y'all keep us alive and running smoothly. And of course, a big old thanks goes out to each and every one of you for watching. Until next time. Cheers.